Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range technical forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Now, normally I try to get these videos out to you midday, but today I'm a little late because I spent the morning kind of working on some new uh, code to show you this map, and I also really wanted to wait on the 12Z model runs. So what we've got here is a map that shows you over the last month the data daily average surface wind speed anomaly. And as you look at this map, you can see that much of the United States has been very windy, not only over the last month, but before that as well. But I want to draw your attention to a few areas. And the first is the central plains of the U.S. getting up in the Canadian prairies, where in here we've averaged between 6 and 10 miles an hour greater than normal daily average wind speed. So this is this is telling you that some days we've had gusts 40, 50, 60 miles an hour and just a persistent, very windy condition uh, set up here. But the other places I want to talk about are, are in the uh, equatorial regions here in both um, the Pacific and in the Atlantic. And we're going to compare in this video what's going on here, not only at the surface, which is what this map is showing you, but we're going to compare it to what's going on in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, where things have been quite windy. So keep this all in the back of your mind as we go through this presentation. Because again today, look at these strong winds coming out of south central Texas, meeting up with some winds coming out of the you know, Arizona, New Mexico area, and just bringing in relatively dry and fast winds, 10 to 30 plus miles an hour. Now the problem is that over the last half of a month, we have, with these strong southerly winds, really dried out the soil in this area. Some places in here, as we just look back over the last 16 days, have evaporated um, upwards of um, up to six inches of moisture out of the soil. Now crystal ball's path is seen right in through here, but if you get over here into the eastern Corn Belt, over into parts of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Michigan, that area is dried out. It's dried out in parts of the northeast as well, and you can see the drier extensions that get down here in parts of the Mid-South and the Southeast. Now remember, we do have very heavy rain, you know, in the last few days and getting into the next few days over parts of the Carolinas and Virginia as well. But with continued uh, hot, dry winds in the next couple of days coming through the South Central Plains, I'm concerned about, again, this expansion of the drop. But we got to talk about the rainfall. We're going to get to that in just a few minutes. Now, if you would have showed me this map out of context and said, hey, we've seen this now here uh, just before spring officially or ends and summer officially begins, I would have had a lot of concern. And this is what I would have been concerned about. So this is the last 15 days of temperature anomalies. And we can see that right here in the midsection of the country, we've been averaging uh, some places three upwards of 10 degrees above average. So when we start to see that, the concern that comes into a meteorologist's head is, okay, well, could this lead toward more troughing west, ridging in the central United States, and then troughing over like the Canadian Maritimes? Because if we build a, tr a big ridge into the midsection of the United States that runs from Texas through basically the Red River of the north, our concern is that higher atmospheric pressure near the surface builds just downstream of it to the east, and the flow around that high goes something like this. And the problem is with flow like that is you don't have the ideal situation to be transporting moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico. And hence, this would be a pattern that would really block up and resist bringing in moisture, which would mean any drought that's in place will continue to move. So if you knew that that would be my concern, if I would have seen this, we need to then compare that to what's actually going to be happening. Now, there has been some benefit to that heat, and that has been that we've started to pick up uh, inside this area and, and to the west of the two lines I just drew there, uh, quite a bit of uh, growing degree day uh, units. So now we're sitting in there between 40 and 140 GDUs above average. And of course, it gets much higher as you get over here toward um, you know, the southwest where uh, we've been some, seeing some extreme heat as you get down there in and around Phoenix where we do have quite a few wildfires in Arizona, New Mexico, and in the southwest. But do notice from here, to the east, we are in deficit still with GDUs. Uh, we start calculating these from the uh, 1st of April. So uh, just an important map to keep in the back of our minds as we progress forward with this forecast. Now let's talk about temperatures first today. You see the jet stream right now is set up with a, a trough that sneaks into the Gulf of Alaska, a ridge building over the west, but it dives into a pretty sizable trough here before running over the top of this cutoff low in this area that is uh, keeping things really cloudy, cool, and very wet uh, over uh, parts of North Carolina and Virginia. In fact, I was talking to my good friend, Dr. Dave Cole this morning. He says, when can you get this out of here? I said, the problem, Dave, is it's cut off and the trough that's behind 
behind it's moving relatively slowly. Now that's going to bring up two important things in this forecast. I'm going to get to them in just a few seconds. But why start off with that animation is to first talk temperature. Now you remember the flow is doing something like this and the cutoff low is there. So what's happening is the heat that was in the central plains is building in this direction over the coming days. So over the next five days, big warm up that's gonna be happening over the Great Lakes states. But behind this, the trough kicks through and really drops the temperatures off. I saw this morning from a good friend of mine, Sierra, that's here in, in uh, Montana saying, bring the heat back on because they, they've gone over cool. Both the GFS and the European saying the same thing. Now, what I wanna do for you next, I, I hope you find this analysis interesting. I went back for every June, since 1948 and I put a line and the line kind of denotes where the mean flow of the jet stream is and in general we can kind of see it coming in and it does something like that in other words if you were to take the average that that's what the average is now some years are extreme and I, I know some of these years by heart for example this is where the jet stream was during June of 1988 and that massive ridge you know what it did to the midsection of the United States so the question becomes what is this end of June and the beginning of July gonna look like, because July looks very similar to this. So I wanna draw a few lines on top of this for you. Over the next seven days, that's gonna be the mean position uh, of the jet stream. So really at day seven, that's where we expect it to be. And then by day 10, we're expecting it to look something like this. Now, do you notice that during this time period, there seems to be, let me get my drawing off there for you, all right? There seems to be in this area, just kind of a general tr trough pattern. And a ridge that's here by day seven kind of moves there by day uh, 10. Now, the models tend to wash out these features once we get beyond day 10, but I at least can show you what the current pattern looks like 15 days from now, the beginning of July. So July 1, they're looking at the jet stream from the European model, basically following a path like this. So that would mean, potentially, as we work our way into July, a pretty sizable warm-up. But what does it mean in terms of precipitation? So first, remember what I just showed you? We expect in the 6 to 10 day time period, as that trough builds in, remember, that we're going to be seeing near average to maybe cooler than average temperatures. Now before you look at this and start thinking, oh, it's going to be cold, this is still highs in the middle to upper 80s. I mean, it's the end of June. So when you look in here and you see this cool bias, it's, it's backing us off from 90s back into the you know, mid to upper 80s. That's what both models are advertising. And then as we look out there to day uh, uh, 15, remember, this is when the jet stream was doing something a bit more like that. And therefore, we start to see the warmth spreading all in this area. And we're going to talk about why it could be down here that we see some cooler weather, well, near average, and the heat's going to be much farther uh, to the central and northern part of the United States. So keep that all in the back of your mind now as we switch over to precipitation and pull it all together in a few moments. Now I'm going to show you precipitation from multiple sources. This has been a week where we have been looking at every modeling source we can, trying to pick which model is going to get this right. So this is the 12Z model run, initialization I should say, for the WPC's forecast. And we can see that as that trough, remember that trough that was here just slowly moves and leaves a frontal boundary in this area, we're going to have multiple days in through this corridor of seeing showers and storms. Now, the most important thing, honestly, about this is how far to the west this gets and how much rain really falls in this corridor where we have drought conditions, okay? It has been dry in the eastern Corn Belt, but we've not seen the extreme heat, and therefore the dryness has not been met with problematic heat, which means we can probably buy a little bit more time if we do get some precipitation in there. But this looks like for parts of eastern Nebraska getting into Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, western Illinois, Missouri, quite a, quite a bit of rainfall. Now, here is the cutoff low and its influence on the um, parts of the Mid-Atlantic then getting down into parts of Virginia and North and South Carolina. So let's now do a multi-model analysis. Now, I'm going to switch color bars here, but that's okay. You'll still be able to see it. Now, this is what I was waiting on. This was the 0Z European model forecast from now all the way out to next Wednesday morning. And this is the newest run. So let's just go from here to the 12Z run. And if I go back and forth, you see some differences, but they're not stark differences. And a few things I want to point out here. Notice that in the European, in parts of Oklahoma specifically, there could be places that get a lot of rain and places that are missed. You can also see a very hard edge on where we have less than a half inch of rain for some places. I'm talking specifically about the Eastern Corn Belt or getting down to this part of the South. Now from here, what I want to show you next is the ICON model. This is a German model. And what you notice here is that if this is the 12Z European, this is what the German model is saying. It also has a relatively strong 
marked delineation here on how far that front progresses. Very wet into this corridor, but otherwise east of there, kind of missing out. In fact, you can see a large donut hole right here in terms of precip. Let's go from the icon over to the GFS solution. Now the GFS wants to give out rain to everybody. Uh, this is the, of course the US model and what you notice here is that it brings much higher rainfall amounts over into the Eastern Corn Belt and it brings heavy precipitation all the way over to all, all of Oklahoma. Now, if I'm in Oklahoma and I'm trying to figure out this forecast, it must be maddening because some models want to give you two to three tenths of an inch of rain and the GFS wants to give you three to four inches of rain. And it's just going to be a matter of where the tail end of that front lingers and what we get in terms of moisture transport as to where those storms are going to go. But again, this is getting out into this upcoming weekend where we're going to be seeing this. So it's a difficult forecast still. And just uh, to, for completeness, I want to show you the gem. So this is a Canadian model and it's got a, honestly a much different scenario here. And I hate to say it, but I'm going to leave the gem model as an outlier at this point, primarily because of what it's doing in through this area here. I, I, I'm struggling to see a few things about this model. So if you don't mind, we're going to toss it out and stick with our other three models as our, our big picture here. Now, after we get beyond that, take a look at what the flow does again. So that's day seven, and this again is day 10. And we end up getting in this area some northwest flow. And also during that same time period with the northwest flow in this direction, nothing is shutting down the Gulf of Mexico. So what ends up happening with northwest flow is we tend to initiate storms and then they're blown in this direction toward the unstable air. I'll just label that with a U and therefore they tend to go into that region. Now, how do I know it's not blocked? Well, looking out here on day 10, so this is Saturday the 27th, the Bermuda High is over Bermuda. So the flow around this is something like this. And in general, we kind of see the atmospheric circulation featuring lower pressure here, which means we're kind of doing something like this, which could initiate storms that come through the United States in that direction with moisture transport in this direction. So when I look at all of that, I say, all right, if that's the case, do you see how both the GFS and the European into week two keep this corridor wet and this corridor wet? See it? And that's why this week two model analysis is kind of coming to better alignment, better than the week one for some reason, only because the models at least agree on what that upper level flow is going to look like. So again, we're not looking at anything at this point that tells me to, to, to be overly alarmed about the drought continuing to spread. Uh, so what I feel like this next two week forecast does is it buys time for some folks that have been very, very dry. That's really the way that I think about this. Now let's get into the details. Or well, let's get into the dynamics. Something that's got to be watched carefully. We know that in our La Nina, our developing La Nina right here, look, we've even got a reflection of it coming off of uh, parts of Africa, okay? In this area where we've had our stronger trades, there's still more cold water beneath this that's emerging. But while that's been happening, the North Pacific has really not changed too much. And even though there's cooler water that's here right now, I see a lot of abundant sunshine here as we approach the solstice, which means I think this particular area is going to warm up with time. I would be very concerned if I saw this whole area going over cold as we work our way into the month of July, but we don't see it. What we do notice I wanted you to see is right here, okay? Because where the blues meet the reds, there's gonna be surface convergence, which means the air is coming together, which means it's gonna rise right around 100 degrees east. Now at that particular point where the strong trade winds are meeting this westerly wind burst, the air is gonna rise there. And that particular point is right here on these diagrams. So we're looking at velocity potential, which means air is rising in the cooler colors, sinking in the warmer colors. But we started to notice something quite interesting here. So remember, uh, where this sits on top of is somewhere in this vicinity, phase two or three of the uh, MJO. But do you notice how it seems to kind of, with time, curl back to the um, to the west. Normally the MJO progresses around this diagram in this direction, counterclockwise, okay? But what's going on right now is the MJO is currently sitting here and the latest forecast spread is taking it, well, what we would call in the wrong direction. And that's a very interesting bit of behavior in the MJO. So I started asking myself some questions about the MJO because as we look out over the next 10 days, it's gonna feature rising motion here, so we'll put a dot in the middle of that, sinking motion there, and rising motion over here as well, which means I want folks to be watching right here, uh, coming out of the Caribbean or you know, in this side of Central America for tropical cyclone development, okay? 
day 15, you know, it's looking something like this, which really isn't too much change. So I started asking some questions and I read a couple of, uh, of, of abstracts of some papers trying to understand the MJO's relationship in summer. So I did this in an attempt to understand it. I found the hottest July weather we've had in the central United States. And I'm talking, this is the whole box over which I'm doing this analysis, okay? What we found during that time period was that there was good upper level motion here and a lot of sinking motion there on the hottest Julys. Now watch this. This was the coolest Julys, but the only difference is this, but not much difference over here. I kept going. I said, well, what about the driest Julys in the central United States? Well, we had uh, rising motion here and sinking motion there. And then the wettest, well, this was still present, but this kind of shifted back. And what was interesting about some of the research I found is that the MJO is usually a very strong predictor out maybe 20 to 45 days, except for in summer. It's not a good predictor in summer. And some of this is really kind of showing that it's a predictor, but just not the best. So I had asked myself these questions as we finish up. If there's not a clear signal coming from the tropics, and what I mean by that is the MJO and what the winds are doing in response to developing La Nina, if I'm in the United States, if I'm in the Canadian prairies, these are the two things we have to talk about. Is anything shutting down the Gulf of Mexico? And is there any signal of a block in the North Pacific or North Atlantic that shuts the whole jet stream down? So as we look out over the entire month of July, now we're looking at the European weeklies. It wants to keep the Bermuda high even to the east of Bermuda here. And the flow pattern doing something like that. What I don't see in the European weeklies is any indication of putting in higher atmospheric pressure right into this area. That would shut us down. Instead, we have our normal, almost climatological subtropical highs where they're supposed to be. So that's the first part of this, okay? On top of that, I think about right now what our root zone soil moisture looks like. And you can divide this up. We've got an abundant amount of soil moisture in general, if you're east of that line, and it's dry in places and very dry in certain places, like for example, here and a little bit farther to the north and there to the west. But we do know we're bringing in rainfall into this area. Okay, if that moisture is there in the soil, and I think about what July can do. It's going to bring moisture from the Gulf, and it's going to bring moisture as a secondary source from evapotranspiration out of the soil and out of the plants that are growing here. What we don't have going into July is drought that's expanded over a large area, right? So that tells me that July, while we could get dry at times, isn't going to be the kind of dry that ruins a crop, at least what we're seeing right now. So then I come to my last question. Are there's signals that the North Pacific and North Atlantic are getting blocked up. It happened last year. This drop off in July of the global atmospheric angular momentum was in the Northern hemisphere. It was in the North Pacific. Those winds slowed down. It then did it again in September. Okay, we built momentum after that into fall and winter. And we've had relatively high momentum for a while. Now the momentum has dropped off considerably down here to one and a half standard deviations below average. But most of this momentum loss is in the Southern Hemisphere, which means the North Pacific hasn't necessarily just slowed down and shut off. And recently, it started to maybe do a little bit of a bounce. And some of the forecast models bring it back up here toward, you know, normal. If this doesn't happen, this is where I'm going to be really wrong. And I'll be honest with you, I can, I can be very wrong. Um, if that shuts down the North Pacific, everything blocks up and it gets hot. At this point, my biggest concern is that happening in August, maybe September, when this La Nina really gets a good grip. I'm more worried about later in the summer than in the next few weeks. So this is where the analysis could really screw up. This is what the flow of the atmosphere looks like through the entire month of July by the European. And you remember what I showed you earlier? It looks pretty darn close to climatology. And if it keeps a ridge back in this area, which would be normal, Northwest flow through here, no blocking highs sitting in this area, and we end up getting a pretty normal July. So that's it. That's what we're going to be watching. And if you get a sense that I am not confident, no, I'm not. I think this is one of the time periods where given the transitions in the Pacific and what's going on with the global winds, I don't think any of us can be confident in our long range forecast, but I'll still report it to you what I know. And that's what I know. All right. Have a good one. I'll talk to you again tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you.